Welcome to the Radiant Visalia podcast. Join us at one of our two services, 9 a.m. and 1045 a.m. Download the Church Center app or visit our website, radiantvisalia.com, to stay connected with us. All right, enjoy. Chloe's going to come up and read our scripture as Trav prepares to bring the word today. Can you please stand uh, for the reading of God's word? This comes from the book of Matthew, verse 7, 7 through 12. If you don't have a Bible, you can grab one from the seat in, rack in front of you. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know who know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You may be seated. I'm not going to take us back into song. Don't don't worry. But um, this is a real um, treasure to me. It is a. 1955 uh, Martin acoustic guitar, and if you've been around guitars or know anything about guitars, you probably know why this is uh, a treasure to me. Um, This is valuable, Um, but it's the story behind this guitar that makes it a real uh, treasure to me. I spent most of my 24th year here on earth uh, longing for this guitar. Most of 24 was spent longing for this. My plan was to sell the guitar I had, was a tailor, and to use the money I had to purchase this guitar from a guy named Mitch Carroll. He was something of like a guitar Yoda here in Visalia. Guitar guru was Mitch, and he had this Martin, and he was going to uh, sell it to me. So I did, in fact, sell the acoustic guitar I had, but I had to sell my acoustic guitar to pay the bills. So rather than buy what I wanted, I think I paid the electric bill, which was... So, so sad. And again, only those of you who play guitar know how very sad that story is. And um, Tiff and I had only been married for a few years. We were uh, struggling to make it. Um, Tiff had launched a photography studio that was super creative. And like most things that are super creative, it was super not making any money. That same year, I had lost my job as a part-time youth pastor, and I lost uh, that job because I knew I needed to get a full-time job, so I marched into the leaders of the church and tried to play hardball and basically said, look, I need to get a full-time job. I can't support my family, so I think that full-time job needs to be here as your youth pastor, and they said, I don't think so. We don't think so. (laughs) So that was tough. That was like a Shark Tank episode gone wrong. You know, I (laughs) tried to throw my weight around and it didn't uh, work. So I started a a business. I started a lawn care business called Sow and Reap. And and I know nothing (laughs) about that. (laughs) But a bunch of people in the church were kind enough to be like, I'll let the kid mow my lawn. He seems hard up. He had to sell his guitar. So 
Anyway, I, uh, I was actually mowing Tom and Annette Buckley's uh, lawn who, who go here when I got a phone call from Mitch. And Mitch said, hey, do you want to buy this guitar or not? Because if you don't, I'm going to sell it. And that's when I told Mitch that I didn't have the money to buy this guitar. And he said, well, anyway, I'm going to sell it. So I started doing what we do. Is there some place I, I'm, I'm done with this prop and I don't know what to do now? All right, thanks. So, so I get off the phone, I'm mowing a lawn, and I start just finagling. How can I get that guitar? I need $900, and um, you know, I'm thinking, I've probably got long hair at the time. I'm thinking, well, locks of love, if I sell my hair, will give me a certain amount of money. And I'm pushing a mower, and I am deeply discouraged, as deeply as discouraged as a 24-year-old can be, I think. I'm, I'm there. Bit of a dark night of the soul. And I hear a whisper in my ear as I'm mowing um, that says, you have not because you ask not. And at first, I'm really suspicious of the whisper, even though I know it's a scripture, because I'm suspicious of kind of, I think what I've seen as kind of blank check Christian kind of prayer theology, that God gives us blank checks and you can write in whatever the heck you want and he'll answer it right away. So I'm suspicious of this invitation because it seemed too open-ended. It seemed too good, right? Right? I worked through that, and I, I was as I'm mowing, I'm thinking, well, fine, then I ask. You know, I can't. <laughs> but really, I wrestled all day to ask. I wrestled with my pride. I, I wrestled through what I deserved. I wrestled through, even if I ask, the only person who knows I want this guitar is Tiffany, and I know what's in Tiffany's bank account. So there's not the money needed to get this guitar. I wrestled with questions like, does God even care about guitars? Doesn't he have bigger fish to fry? I wrestled with the reality that I actually had another guitar. As you know, if, you know, if you're here and you have guitars, you know that there, there is usually more than one where that came from. So I was like, I have guitars, you know, and there's people in third world countries that don't even have a guitar, one guitar, you know. Um, really, really the big thing was this is my fault. I tried to shark tank this deal and it went down. <laughs> and if I'd have been better with my money, I, I'd be in a place to purchase this guitar. And if I'd have done it better. So I, I really wrestled all day with these deep questions of, I could and should be a better husband. I should be providing better than I am. I wrestled with failing uh, as a youth pastor. And um, this went on all day. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but sometimes it, it can be really hard on your faith to pray. Sometimes it can be easier on your faith to just not ask because lots of doubts, fears surface as we make ourselves vulnerable and bring our requests before God. So a few days later, I get invited to my parents' house for, for dinner. And as I'm eating dinner uh, with my dad, who, who's usually quiet as we eat, if you know my dad, um, he says to me, hey, my guitar upstairs needs some help. Could you take a look at it, maybe try to tune it? So I run upstairs to his room to tune what I think is his guitar. And I open up the guitar case. <laughs> Man, and, and that guitar is in the case. <clears throat> and uh, I just weep. And my dad comes upstairs and... He goes, I thought this was supposed to make you happy, 
you know? <laughs> and I was like, well, I wrestled for like three days to ask for this. How did you even know I needed, needed? That's a, that's a great way. <laughs> this was part of the struggle. It was most clearly a want. <laughs> and uh, so he said, I heard you, uh, I overheard you talking to Tiff about it a couple months ago. And uh, I knew I was supposed to get it for you. And so I called Mitch. <laughs> Mitch called me. <laughs> Because my dad called him to say, can I buy that guitar? And then Mitch said, some guy, some random guy wants to buy this guitar. Crazier than that was I opened a card from my dad, and on the front of it, it said, since we know that he hears us, we ask, and we know that we'll receive. I'm sure my mom gave him the card, you know. <laughs> I <laughs> probably said, you know, write something nice in it, you know, but. Changed. I, I didn't get a guitar out of this. Um, I got something of God himself and what God did in my heart through meeting me in this dark time. birthed this church. So this isn't about if you pray, you get guitars. This is about God. I also prayed fervently uh, for my friend Mike, who's a part of this uh, church. I prayed fervently that he would recover from COVID when he was hospitalized I thought surely he was coming through. I prayed hard because he had a word from God and I felt like he had good days ahead. And yesterday we had his memorial here at this church. And I was with hundreds of people who had prayed hard, fervently, that God would heal uh, Mike. And he passed. And as Kinley shared this morning, I know I'm not the only one who has stories like this. Many of us in prayer have experienced the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. Many of us have bumped up against these questions and these doubts as to how this works and why it works and when it works. Most of us probably have a story of God answering some sort of quick or flippant prayer for a parking spot. And then most of us have a story of earnestly seeking God for something we were sure was inside the will of God. Something we knew that a good God would want to do and coming up empty in the end. You were confident that you weren't asking with selfish motives. You were confident that God would answer and the request was denied. So this passage comes at us and it's super simple, but it's really, really complex, isn't it? It's super simple. It doesn't need to be unpacked. If you ask, you will receive. If you seek, you will find. If you knock, things will open up for you. And we have struggled to do this thing that Jesus invites us to do. At this point in our lives, we're not 24, I'm 42. And now I hear Jesus having to ask me to ask. I'm asking you to ask. His whole theology of prayer could be summed up with that one word, ask. Ask. Present your requests before God. Come to the Father with what you need and you'll receive. Why did it take me so long to ask? When I heard the whisper say, hey, you have not because you asked not, why wasn't it like 
Okay. Why was it all day wrestling with pride, wrestling uh, with shame, wrestling with the risk of it, wrestling uh, with fear? We're all assured that you should just ask because the worst thing that could happen is that they say no. But somehow it feels like it's worse than that. It's a scary thing. So Jesus is asking us to ask this morning. Why? Why is he having to ask us to ask? Well, I can think of a few reasons that come up in this text. The first is that we have unresolved questions about the character of God. Jesus goes right in to framing for us the character of our Father Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Quite simply, we struggle to ask because I don't think we see God the way Jesus saw God. This uh, generous, kind, eager, loving, all-powerful God who loves to give, who can't be outgiven, the one who can't be outdone, the one who's on his toes, withholding nothing, moving towards us. Now, we say we believe this God, We could all recite these things about our Father, but I find that what we really believe about God lies buried under a bunch of things we've learned to recite. And sometimes when I look at my prayerless life, I find an understanding of God's character that maybe he's stingy, that he's cold, that he's hard, that he's distant, that he's waiting for me to get it right. And then and only then will he give. The good news of this gospel we're studying in Matthew is that Jesus came so that we would get our father facts straight. He came to reveal the father. So we wouldn't be left down here speculating. Jesus has revealed the Father. We now know what the Father is like because of Jesus. And he's super committed to us understanding who we're dealing with. And here we have him say, this is so interesting to me. Here we have him saying on the topic of prayer, hey guys, when you get ready to go before God, it's really important. Your posture is really important. You're going to want to sit up straight. You're going to want to look him in the eyes. Don't look down and don't mumble. Speak directly to him and address him this way. No. Jesus is like, oh, I've seen the father. I would get to ask him. I would ask him. Those that ask, receive. Those that seek, find. If you start knocking, doors are going to open to you. I've seen him. I know him. I would get in the game if I were you. Don't worry about getting it right. Just get in the game. Well, what should we ask for? Doesn't matter. Just get going. Well, what if I say it wrong or ask for the wrong thing? Just move. Move towards him. I promise you it's going to work out for you. I'd pedal that bike. It'll be easier to keep it upright if you just keep your feet moving. I wouldn't worry about asking for the right thing. You have a generous father, and I would get in the game. You may have heard, and and this is true, uh, you may have heard of this text that these verbs, ask, seek, knock, are these present imperatives, which mean that you keep on asking, you keep on seeking, you keep on knocking. And, And most of this is rightly an attempt to get us to persist 
in prayer and to invite us into a repetition. But I think we need to be really careful when we stress that part of this passage because the theme of persistence can unknowingly in us create a God who's like tired and he's like, oh my gosh, you pestered me. And so anyway, or busy or just uninterested. And you have to fight to get his attention. That's not the Jesus, that's not the God that Jesus describes. The character of God is so crucial in sustaining our prayer lives. We, we, listen, we frame our requests based on our understanding of the character and the ability of the one we are addressing. We ask friends to help us move who have a truck. We frame our requests based on our understanding of the character of that person and the ability of the one we're addressing. It's so crucial. Any of you have, um, I'm going to try to describe this, but any of you have a friend who's like a direct liner? Like they pray and things happen. If you don't, you should get one in your friend group. Or, <laughs> You know, you're just like, wow, man, they are coincidences are always happening to them, you know? Maybe the better language is not a direct liner, but a prayer warrior. Maybe that's the word we, they're like, when they say they're going to pray for you, you're like, oh yeah, that, that was not just like something they said. They're probably going to pray. And things are going to happen because when they happen, for whatever reason, when they pray, for whatever reason, things happen. I think that when you find a direct liner or when you find a person who is a prayer warrior, I find this to be true about them. Most people judge God's character based on their circumstances. I'm broke. I'm sick. I'm alone. Therefore, God is blank. When you find a direct liner or a prayer warrior you find someone who judges their circumstances based on God's character. God is this. And still, I've got cancer, I'm broke, whatever it is. But their circumstances are being viewed through the lens of God's character instead of God's character being viewed through the lens of their circumstances. It is so essential that we tend to what we think about God and our prayerlessness, our inability to ask, I think this passage invites us into this, it might be that you have a view of the Father that Jesus meant to crucify. You are still holding on to a view of God that Jesus came to kill. We have a good, loving generous father and this fueled Jesus's prayer life. Don't get mixed up. We have a good father who loves to give. Don't be deceived, my brothers and sisters. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. The second thing I think it makes it hard to ask um, is, you know, for some of us, we struggle to trust that God loves us and is for us. And that could be for a, a number of reasons. But I think there are others who just have unresolved questions about the effectiveness of prayer. Like this is an intellectual problem usually, or at least it fronts this way. Does prayer work is the question. If it works, how does it work? Is it just coincidence? Are we talking a law of averages here? Does God genuinely change what he's going to do because I hounded him? 
Am I pulling the levers of human history? Or is God going to do what God's going to do? What is the point of prayer? What is the point of asking? If God already knows, why do I need to ask? Right? This is some of the question. And this is a deep, deep rabbit hole. Um, one that we can't touch today. But this intellectual problem in prayer um, does breed in us, these questions breed a sort of paralysis in us, a sort of resignation, a sort of cynicism at times. Well, it's just going to go the way it's going to go. It doesn't matter what I have to say about it. And if God is good and God is in control, then he's going to do what he's going to do. We'll have other times to get to this question in, in Matthew 18 and Matthew 21, but I just simply want to bring us right back to this text right here. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, says Jesus, and it will be opened to you for everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds and the one who knocks, it will be opened. This may be evident to you guys, but what happens to the person who doesn't ask? Is it safe to say that they don't receive? What happens to the person who doesn't seek? Is it safe to say that they won't find? What happens to the person who doesn't knock? Will those doors not open? I think so. I think Jesus means what he says here. I was so stirred by Isaiah 65. Let me read it to you. The first verse of Isaiah 65. What a strong charge this is. God says, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. I spread out my hands all day to a rebellious people. Here's the antidote. If you're one of those people here who wrestles intellectually with the idea of prayer and is prone to a sort of resignation or fatalism about it all, here's what I believe Jesus is asking. Ask. Ask boldly. Humble yourself in childlike faith and get in the game. This promise is so scary, open-ended. It's Again, it's like he doesn't even care. Just get your mouth moving. Just get in there. The paralysis that sets in. Am I asking the right thing? Honestly, if I ask it, would it? If you're hung up in that, humble yourself in childlike faith and get in the game. Get your mouth moving. Start asking. Well, it could be for selfish motives. It's always with selfish motives. I'm not sure I've ever asked for something that didn't have selfish motives. Get going. Like a child, ask. Again, what do kids ask for? Anything. Everything. When do they stop asking? Never. They never stop asking. Do they care that you only have two hands? No. Do they care that you've had coffee? Absolutely not. Do they care about your account? Your emotional state? No. If you're here and you're stuck intellectually, ask boldly.
Rowan Williams, he's the, he was the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's a, a very learned man. I love this quote on prayer. When I pray, coincidences happen. When I don't pray, coincidences don't happen. That, that is smart. Humbly present your request to God. You have not because you ask not. Lastly, and I think this is probably the biggest one, is that I think there's, for many of us, unresolved hurt around unanswered prayer. These aren't intellectual problems as much as they are emotional ones. Moments where we went all in and again felt like we came up empty and Most of us have a story like this. And then to top it all off, there's frustration with Jesus who said, if you had faith the size of a mustard seed, a mountain would move. And you're like, I had an acorn, dude. It wasn't even a small seed. I was standing in faith. And I felt crushed. Not exactly overcoming, but overcome. I really want us to, as we think about unanswered prayer and the difficulty of unanswered prayer, I I really want us to, to lean into this analogy that Jesus gives us about a father and a child, a father and a son, a parent and a child. Because he says, ask, your good, generous father is ready to respond. He's more available, he's more active, and he's more attentive than you know. So I'd get, your, I'd get in the game. But you're here, and, and if you've been parented or you are a parent, even if you're not a good parent, you know that a good father doesn't only and always say yes. That as parents... We're trusted by God to know what is uh, best. And if you want good for your child, you don't always grant their desires. So if you think that this is condoning some sort of blank check prayer theology, that you get whatever you ask for, just lean a little bit deeper into this idea of a father, a good father, a generous father even, is not going to grant us everything we ask for. And we will wrestle with unanswered prayer. The answer to our intellectual problems is to cultivate childlike faith and to ask boldly, because we've got a generous father The answer to our experience, our emotional experience in prayer, is to surrender completely because we have a good Father who can be trusted. The secret to prayer, the secret to asking, I think, sustained, persistent asking before God. The key to this is to ask boldly and surrender completely. James, the brother of Jesus, steps in in James 4, and he says, you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. So he presents to us these cliffs or these sides of the horse we can fall off on. You can fall off on fatalism and not ask, or you can fall off on asking for selfish reasons. So on one cliff, you're not asking. You've given up on that. On the other side, you're asking for selfish reasons. The antidote to not asking is to ask boldly. The antidote to asking for selfish reasons is to surrender completely. Come with me to the garden. I want to read from Mark 14 to conclude our time. Sean, would you go ahead and come? Mark 14, 32, Jesus is on his way to be crucified. And he models for us asking boldly, 
and then also surrendering completely. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter and James and John, and he began to be greatly distressed and troubled. And he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch. And going a little farther, he fell on the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said it like this, Abba, Father, everything's possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet not what I will, but what you will. And he came back to his friends and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter and Simon, are you asleep? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And again, he went away and prayed, saying the same words. This is not just asking once. This is seeking. This is knocking. And again, he came back to his friends and he found them sleeping for their eyes were very heavy and they did not know what to answer him. And he came a third time and said to them, are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. The son of man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us be going. See my betrayer is at hand. Jesus avoids the cliff of not asking. He avoids the fatalism. He comes before his father and he says, dad, if there's like any other way, I'd like that way. Can we not do this? I don't want this cup. Could this pass from me? And then he models for us surrender completely. Yet not my will but yours. He avoids the cliff on the other side of asking for selfish reasons. Jesus comes to us now to comfort us. If you're dealing with the hurt of unanswered prayers, he comes to comfort us. He knows what it is to ask and not receive. Did the cup pass from him? Was his prayer answered? Well, I think kind of yes and no. Because ultimately what Jesus wanted was to glorify the Father. To reveal the Father to us. He suffered in our place. He goes to the cross as a substitute for us so that we don't have to suffer in some of those ways. But also, Jesus suffered as a model for us. What it will look like for us to carry our cross and the things that we may face. And in that way, he comes as a companion, a brother, someone who comes alongside of us and knows what it is to ask boldly and to surrender completely. And I love this about the passage. His friends can't stay with him to the point where he's like, this is, this is too hard. This is too hard. And when we come to the place of wrestling with and through unanswered prayer, we now don't go it alone. We're with him. He's our great high priest who knows what it is to wrestle with this. Would you stand with me? We're going to lift our hearts to him in worship.
and we're going to come to the table. And as you come to the table, I want you to think about the father who didn't spare his own son. How much more will he grant us all things? He's generous, giving of himself. Ponder the generosity of God. And as you come, ask boldly again. And as you come to the table, surrender completely to him. Get back in the game this morning. Thanks for listening. We want to be a resource for you as you walk with Jesus. So please connect with us at radiantvicelia.com. Until next time. There is a heavenly city that I'm compelled to find. Oh, I love the flowers and trees and the smell of the grinding sea. And all the beautiful things here in life I